Please consider becoming a patron of Myth Vision Podcast. You'll get early access to every video, including this amazing one. And you can ask me personal questions, private message me, anything you'd like. Professor Elaine Pagels, what uh, motivated you or what was your driving purpose in diving deep into the book of Revelation, writing your book on the book of Revelation? Well, you know, Derek, this is the most controversial book in the Bible. It always has been from the very start. I mean, some people said it was heresy. Some people said it was true prophecy. And they were fighting about it thousands of years ago, right after it was written. And, and Martin Luther said it didn't belong in the Bible and, you know, all kinds of controversy. So I, would, I really didn't go near that book for a long time. But there was a time um, when I, the work that I do took me to Egypt because of the secret gospels, that's where they were found. And I spent quite a bit of time in Egypt. And the Egyptians loved America. They wanted to have blue jeans. They wanted to hear American music. They love America, right? This is when I went there. But at a certain point, uh, President Bush decided to invade Iraq. This was, of course, after 9-11. And he didn't go for al-Qaeda, which would have been the right thing to do. He could have gone into the camps in Afghanistan. But instead, he went you know, into Iraq, which wasn't involved with 9-11 in the way that he claimed. And I thought, how do you turn the entire Arab world against the United States? It's, it's by that kind of that kind of act. I think Saddam Hussein was a terrible man, but agree with him on that. But that act was bound to turn Arabs against the United States. And I thought, why did he do that? And then I discovered that he, being a Christian, an evangelical Christian, was basing it on the book of Revelation. And I thought, wow. I mean, how do you take a book that's 2,000 years old and say it applies to what's going on now. So I thought, how does that work? Because, you know, people have been reading it for 2,000 years as if it were always about what's going on right now. It might be the second century, it might be the seventh century, it might be the 15th century, it might be the 21st, but it's always current. How does that work? So I started to say, who wrote this book and why did he write it? Um, it, it's clear to people who, who look at that historically that it was written by this prophet who calls himself John of Patmos. Um, he's, we think he was a refugee from the Jewish war against Rome, the Jewish revolution, in which revolutionaries fought the Roman Empire to liberate their land from Rome the way that the American revolutionaries fought to liberate this country from the British. Mm -hmm. And of course, the Jews lost because the Romans had far greater military power. And John was forced to leave Jerusalem, probably with the temple in flames, the whole center of the city burning down. Thousands of people had been slaughtered, raped, robbed. The whole city was absolutely in ruins. And, and John, being a Jew, would have been very deeply distressed to see the great city of, the holy city of Jerusalem destroyed. But John was also a follower of Jesus. And there's something else came up for him because he knew, probably having read Mark's gospel, uh, 13th chapter, that Jesus had prophesied that, there, that terrible things would happen before the end would come. And Jesus said that with those within the same generation will see the kingdom of God come with power. And he said that the Son of Man would come in the heavens um, when, after this terrible time when Jerusalem would be destroyed by war. So John was not only devastated about the destruction of the holy city, but he thought, Jesus prophesied this, and now it's going to happen. So he, like other followers of Jesus, were very excited. So he waited 10 years. When is, when is it going to happen? When is the Son of Man going to return in the clouds? He waited 20 years. 
And he waited 30 years. And it didn't happen. He had left Jerusalem because it was a d destroyed city. He went to Asia Minor, to the great city of Ephesus, in Tur which is now in Turkey. And when he got there, he would, he would go down the huge road that leads into this magnificent Roman city. And the first thing he would see is, is a 20-foot high statue of the reigning emperor Domitian. Now, Domitian is the son of the man, the general Titus, who had taken his troops into Jerusalem. And he's the brother of uh, Titus, who had had his soldiers torch the, the, the temple and destroy the city. So where's the kingdom of God, he might have said. Jesus said it would come within a generation, but John could see that the kingdom that had come with power was not the kingdom of God. It was Rome. And Domitian was now ruling the world, the son of the man who destroyed his own city. And there was an enormous temple to, to the man who had destroyed Jerusalem, uh, Vespasian and, and, and his son Titus, right there in Ephesus. And he must have been quite devastated. And if he went around to other cities, he would see these huge temples to praising Rome, the gods of Rome and the emperors of Rome, rulers of the universe, right? Mm. And if you went to one of these temples, you would see a picture of Emperor Augustus, for example, um, ruling over land and sea. The next one would be Emperor Nero uh, with his, you know, he's about to cut the throat of a, of a naked female slave forced to the ground, and that slave is labeled Britain. The next one is another Roman emperor forcing to the ground a naked female slave whose name is Armenia. And that's the way the Romans pictured the nations they conquered. So you could go around this temple in honor of the Roman emperors and their gods. You could see 30 nations that they had conquered and subdued and pictured as female slaves that were being dominated by Rome. And one of them was Judea, the land of Israel. So other people might be very impressed with the Roman emperors and their gods, but someone like John would be really angry. Where was God? How could he allow that to happen again to the holy city? So John, at that point, when he was in that city of Ephesus, or near, on the island of Patmos, outside of it, he said he saw a vision. And he said Jesus appeared to him, the voice like, you know, thunderous waters, speaking to him and saying, I'm going to show you what's going to happen next. And at that point, he said he was taken up into heaven and shown that God was going to vindicate his people. And there was going to be a battle between the forces of good. The angels in heaven were going to come with the Son of Man and fight all the evil forces, which meant the Romans and their godless people. And he was going to destroy the evildoers and establish his kingdom on earth. The last scene in the book of Revelation, you remember, is mm -hmm. the heavenly Jerusalem is descending like a bride out of heaven. And and God is dwelling in it, and it's a glorious city. Right? That's, that's the end. So that was his picture. And that, I think, was his expectation. He was writing wartime literature, literature that came out of his experience of the agony of war and his fervent hope and faith that God wouldn't let it go on that way, that he was going to come and transform the world. It's a, it's a very powerful book, as you know. Yeah, there's a few interesting details that I caught. I became a full preterist toward the end of my being in Christianity, which simply is a teaching that all prophecy, mind you, I was fundamentalist, yes, evangelical, uh, all prophecy was fulfilled. Everything actually happened. So we're rationalizing and we're trying to make it all work. And the way we looked at Revelation was, well, everything is fulfilled by 70 AD. I know it wouldn't, it doesn't quite fit in your um, mm -hmm. scholarly mindset of how that would be, but we would argue that Revelation was written before 70 as if everything is predicting the 70 AD destruction of Jerusalem. And like these, these like women riding on the beast and stuff and the seven headed beast or the seven hills, things like that. We would reinterpret it to mean the seven hills in Jerusalem or the Jews, the leadership, they were the ones who were the wicked and they were the bad guys in this picture. Oh, but really? this is why I enjoyed listening to your book because it's a, 
it's a breath of fresh air on realizing you don't have to fit everything into that box. And I was trying to fit it with, along with other full preterists that everything is fitting to 70 AD. You mentioned in your book that there was fourth Ezra is also right. taking place in the same post-war situation. Right. He talks about a three headed beast, not a seven. And the three heads are Vespasian, Titus and Domitian. Right. And you know, people have done this forever. And that's very interesting. We really don't know when it was written. Some people that I know, scholars, John Marshall, for example, in Canada, thinks that it was written before the, the fall of Jerusalem. Right. Uh, I don't know. I think most likely it was written after that he came out of the war and was anticipating that that was going to be what would motivate the Lord to come and, and vindicate his people. Well, some of the things they do is they'll say, John supposedly measuring the temple, supposedly. Well, right. following Ezekiel. That's, that's right, and I kind of thought like, is does this, the way they'd interpret that is literally like he's going with a measuring rod and he's actually measuring the actual Jerusalem temple as if it's still standing. So that's their argument of internal evidence to suppose uh. pre-70. And then another one they'll use, things which must soon take place. And they use that whole mellow concept in Greek where everything's about to happen, it's about to happen. Yes, yes. They apply that to the same concept where Jesus is talking about, when you see these things, it's about to happen. So they apply all this language to the synoptic apocalypse, if I could use that language, yes. as the destruction of Jerusalem. Well, it is about the destruction of Jerusalem, I think. And I would, I think it's more likely that it was written really in the aftermath, as like Fourth, fourth Ezra, another Jewish prophet who, who was weeping over the destruction of the city, you know, and saying, how could God allow these godless people to destroy his holy city? And what have we done to deserve this? Mm -hmm. um, so this is, this is the struggle of devout Jews at that time. And um, the beast, you know, the seven hills, I think, are clearly about Rome. Rome, right. And the seven-headed beast is the, the dynasty of the kings, just as you said, and just as it appears in 4th Ezra. Uh, probably from Augustus to the time of Domitian. You can argue which head of the beast is who, <laughs> but, but these are the, the beast with uh, seven heads and, and crowns on its heads. Kings. And so forth. Yeah, these are, these are rulers, and they're right. Roman rulers, and they are monsters and, you know, enemies. I mean, it's clear to me when you... We don't even have to spend a lot of time. I think it's very common sense to see the 666 as Neron Kaiser, yeah. the title for Nero. And then he's red hair, which we get the same description from historians. Like, So when you're looking at extra biblical yes. historical data, you're kind of matching this guy and you're going, he was vicious. And the, even if some of it's not true and it's propaganda about him, well, some of it might be, some of it's probably not. I don't know. What do you Near, think? Everybody knew that Nero was the worst. That's why he appears as the epitome of the worst of the Roman Empire. He was finally condemned to death by his own people into a disgraceful and hideous death, which he only escaped by, by forcing his slave to kill him by sword. Mm -hmm. um, Nero was a dreadful man. So, so, however, how do people keep reading into that for thousands of years? I finally realized, Derek, that this author is using the language He's saturated in the language of the prophets. He mm. reads Isaiah, e Ezekiel, Daniel. Uh, he knows these classical prophets by heart. And he, he sort of uses their images and, and reinterprets them for his own time. It's amazing you're saying, this is so obvious to me, because exactly what the prophet John on the island of Patmos is doing is exactly what, say, Daniel might be doing using older prophets too. And yes. it, it's this this tool, this prophetic, symbolic, like Daniel talks about the four kingdoms or the four right. parts of this big statue. And you see Second Temple Judaism start to reinterpret what the bottom statue was. Oh, it was Greece. No, 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 it's Rome. And they start to make it mean what they want in the yeah. contemporary time. And the prophet Isaiah speaks about Israel's enemy, Babylon, as a whore, right? Uh, she's a queen. She's a prostitute. She's corrupt. She's rich. And, and God is going to 
destroy her and shame her, mm -hmm. that whole city of Babylon. And Babylon is contrasted with the holy city of Jerusalem. So how do, how do people keep reading into it? I finally realized that what John does, he uses these traditional themes from other prophets. He's one of them. And, and, and basically they are images that you could find in any child's nightmare. They're images of monsters, beasts, dragons, horrifying insect-like creatures that appear in Star Wars 3. <laughs> um, and there are angels. And so there's, there's a battle between good and evil. You see this in, in the dramas that we have, like Lord of the Rings, mm -hmm. it's a force of good against evil. You see it in Star Wars, which is about Luke Skywalker, who is, whose name speaks about a heavenly origin, and Darth Vader, who's the dark father, and they clash. So the forces of good and evil are battling in those stories. Um, Harry Potter as well. I mean, these are all stories about forces of good, forces of evil. But the images are so are so universal, like dragons, beasts, monsters, whores, angels, <laughs> um, heavenly kingdoms, that you can plug any conflict you have into that. Like the mark of the beast. People are talking about chips. It's like, oh, well, if you have this on, stamp on your hand, right? Or like if you have the mark on your hand or your forehead, you can't buy or sell. And so everyone's starting to do every time. It's so Nostradamus, if I can use the term, that it can mean almost whatever. You know, the twin cities of the father's flying angels and wings of, and you're like, uh, oh, that means this or that. It's easy. Well, it's, it's, it's a battle of dark forces and light forces, good and evil, God and Satan. And, and that works very powerfully mm -hmm. as a dramatic scenario, apocalyptic scenario from the Hebrew prophets. And, and, and that's why it's so easy to plug in any conflict you have. And of course, whoever's reading it will say, well, we of course are on the side of good. And for example, what I discovered, this, this was quite remarkable to me, that, that when George W. Bush, Bush got um, re intelligence reports about the Iraq war from Donald Rumsfeld, the Secretary of Defense's office, they would appear on his desk in the, in, in the White House with a photograph and a quote from the Bible. Wow. One of them was of the American tanks going into Iraq with all of the guns at the ready. Um, and the quote was from Isaiah, let the righteous nation enter. Another one was about shock and awe. You've heard of shock and awe, which is uh, NASA's name for the, um, for the uh, bombing of uh, Iraq, American bombs destroying uh, much of Iraq. And that is taken from a, a scene in the book of Revelation in which the prophet John sees God's angels, seven angels, with huge bowls which they pour out on the earth. And what they're pouring out is the wrath of God. It is lightning and thunder and earthquakes. So there's a scene in the book of Revelation in which there, John says he sees seven angels and each one has a huge bowl and each bowl is full of God's wrath and one pours God's wrath on the earth and terrible things happen. And then the second angel pours the bowl of God's wrath on the earth and terrible things happen. And then the third and the fourth and the fifth and the sixth. And the sixth angel pours God's wrath on the earth and it says there's Ex huge explosions and noise and lightning, sort of brilliant light, and people die on earth cursing God. And that was taken to be the bombs that are, that are uh, bombing Iraq, which happens to be Babylon. Hmm. It is Babylon, the ancient city of, uh, you know, of God's enemies. So you think that might be motivating factor for why he went there? I don't know. But in any case, he understood it, apparently. It's shock, you see, to unbelievers. But it's awe, if you understand, that the Americans are, are bringing God's wrath at the end of time. Wow. So, you see, I think that he, from what I could tell, and I don't know, genuinely believed that it was his 
divinely given task to fulfill God's will. And he's, he was told that the book of Revelation, um, you know, is, is encouraging the, the operations he took to stamp out evil on earth. So I think he may have been an honest believer who intended that. But that, is, that, that was how I started to understand how do people do this for thousands of years? So that, for example, when Christians started the first crusade against Muslims in the 11th century, the Catholic king of France preached the book of Revelation. You've got to go and save the holy city from the infidels. That's what the book of Revelation is about. So the first crusade with Christian armies going, fighting the Muslims uh, in Jerusalem, was preached as the fulfillment of that prophecy. Then, when you look at the, at the wars in Europe, um, in, for example, Britain, uh, and, and the wars between Catholics and Protestants, both Catholics and Protestants saw this as the coming of the end of time, and they both used the book of Revelation. That's why Luther, Martin Luther, when he was, when he translated the book of Revelation, he had the pictures in it of the, the whore riding on the, the beast, and she was there identified as the Pope of Rome, the Catholic Church. That's what you have to destroy, said, said Luther. And the uh, the Catholics wrote a biography of Luther, and they pictured him as the seven-headed beast. <laughs> On the front piece of, the, of it, you can see Martin Luther with seven heads. You know, this is amazing. I fell into the trap of that interpretation when I was a Protestant because I thought, okay, you really pit yourself against? You're a Protestant. You're protesting against the of Catholic course. Church. And I, I thought this, it's hilarious because I watched a lecture you did on this specifically talking about you this. Did. But it's fascinating because Martin Luther did exactly what Irenaeus, Irenaeus and the early church fathers did. Martin Luther at first goes, eh, nah, uh, this book yeah, doesn't yeah, fit. This, this book doesn't belong, but, but. <laughs> he, he, he figured out how to use it against the Catholic Church. And, and, then, um, and then in the Civil War, it, I can show you, I, maybe you saw this, um, it was used on the southern side to indicate that Lincoln, the president, was being strangled by the beast, which was the Union. Mm. And therefore, it was the, 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 the task of the Confederate Army to destroy the evil beast. And it was used on the North, in which um, the seven-headed beast is, is seen with the seven heads of the Confederate generals. And, and that, that is the evil beast. So what fascinated me, Derek, most of all, is that when you have a conflict like that, the war in this country, the, the Civil War, it is, you, can be used on both sides because both sides can plug themselves into we're the good side, they're the bad side. And then the same thing happened in World War II. Do you know that Adolf Hitler, although not a Christian, his propaganda minister, Josef Goebbels, was a Christian. And Goebbels... Uh, set forth information to German Christians, both Catholics and Protestants, that Adolf Hitler was clearing the way for the coming of Christ. The, the Dritter Reich, the Third Reich, was going to be the third um, millennium in which Christ would rule the earth, but Adolf Hitler was his, his forerunner who had to clear the earth from pollution, which meant for, for the Nazis, it meant homosexuals, it meant Jews, it meant people who resisted Adolf Hitler. So Hitler was acting out the book of Revelation. And on the Allied side, the British, the Americans who were fighting Hitler, also saw Hitler as the beast. So that's what's so striking. You see this also with, uh, with Christian propaganda against Al-Qaeda, and the way that Al-Qaeda and other extremist Muslim groups see this country as the great Satan, the White House is the Black House. I mean, they pick up the same apocalyptic imagery and throw it back. Yep, from their own uh, traditions yes. even. Yes, so that it, that's what's so remarkable about the book of Revelation. It is powerfully written, it's written with passion, it's, it's 
It's emotionally powerful. And it's a perfect ventriloquist used, dummy, though. It is the perfect vent. Make you can kind of puppet it to say. Well, it's very useful, particularly in war, because it is about extreme conflict, and you know. And one of the things that I came to, and I, this, this, I thought it was very interesting to understand something about how the images in that powerful book can be read, you know, can be read in so many ways. And then I thought, there's something about this book that really troubles me, much as I respect the power of the writing. And that is that what it teaches, what that apocalyptic scenario teaches is that you cannot compromise with those people that you think are evil. You cannot negotiate. If you have a conflict, you are, you are on God's side. They are on Satan's side, whoever you think they are. So you have to annihilate them. So what it teaches people is you can't negotiate with the other side. You have to destroy them. That's why you mentioned, for example, QAnon. Mm -hmm. It is a religious movement. It uses the same apocalyptic imagery in its own way. And many of the people, I'm told by people who were there, at when, when many people uh, went into the Capitol on the 6th of January, were serious Christian believers who believed they were saving this country from evil forces. So... The problem I have with the book of Revelation is that that's what it teaches us about conflict. And I think, for myself, I would say what we need to learn about conflict is that people on different sides of important issues have different interests. And if you sit down and listen to them, you do what the American government was set up to do with different parties. You, you negotiate, you listen to them, you give a little, you take a little, they give a little, you take a little, you, you work it out so that you find a solution that isn't the solution of either side, but it's a compromise between people with very different views. That's what the American government was set up to be. Yeah. But that book of Revelation and the way it's this ancient tradition of apocalyptic thinking says, no, you can't, you can't do that. You can't compromise. You have to annihilate them. Hmm. So I think that putting that into our politics or any politics, the politics of Israel or the politics of Turkey or any country whatsoever that is using that kind of imagery um, teaches you that you have to annihilate and destroy the enemy. Thank you.